I'm excited to welcome you to our webinar, Inclusive Practices in Research, Teaching, and Extension during a time of uncertainty. As we carry out our respective roles in fulfilling the mission of our institution, it is important to keep equity and inclusion at the forefront. And it's even more important now to have con these conversations as many of our differences and disparities have been magnified. At a challenging and tough times, I believe, comes the best ideas and innovative solutions. And I continue to be impressed with how my colleagues are able to pivot during these uncertain times and still practice inclusion. The format for today will include five panelists across our college who will be sharing their perspectives, tips, and observations relative to their roles. Dr. Dr. Dorcia Chasen is the Assistant Dean for Academic Advising and Student Success. Naeem Edwards is the Director of the MSU Detroit Partnership for Food, Learning, and Innovation. Emily Proctor is the Tribal Extension Educator and Legislative Leader for the Little Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa Indians Tribal Council. Laura Cooper is the Academic Specialist in the Department of Forestry and Doctoral Student. And Dr. Rebecca Grummet is a professor in the Department of Horticulture and the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, faculty excellent advocate. After Dr. Chasen, the remainder of the session will be moderated by, Dr. by Mr. Leonardo Pizzagna, the MSU Extension Specialist for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. He will also be posting polling questions as we transition to each panelist. Again, thank you for your time and for attending today's webinar. And let's welcome Dr. Dorcia Chasen. Oh, I gotta get this video up. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Let's see. Um, hopefully, you can hear me. Um, and I'll get started. I didn't post any handout. I do have a handout, or it's really my talking points. Um, so I'm happy, very happy to kind of jump into this conversation um, about ambiguity and student success and all of that good stuff. Um, from a background point of view, everyone should know that I primarily, um, as the assistant dean in the Office of Academic and Student Affairs, I work a lot with students, you know, particularly areas of grief, absence, or medical crisis, or working through their disabilities, you know, while travel, trying to navigate the university. Um, and I also, you know, address support for the advisors but you know, like an area of importance and relative to this conversation is um, student success initiatives and you know, like what it looks like. And um, so true at this point of in our, in our lives, our current lives with ambiguity and other things of that nature, you know, like students are struggling and you know, stuff of that nature. The, coronavirus has thrown us into situations and scenarios for which we cannot control, but the outcomes will certainly have an effect for a long time as applied to student success, or for some students, the lack of success in learning. Um, so I'd like to start everyone thinking about, you know, the fact that the the crisis of you know the situation plus the ambiguity and movement to this online or remote learning may have you no know, it really will have a disproportionate effect upon some populations of students okay so just kind of think about that you know foundationally and as applied to you know all of the ambiguity and how to support students and how do we come together as professionals? Um, two areas as applied to that particular broad topic of online and remote learning is one of access, um, you know, the sheer access to Wi-Fi and to a computer. And so many times we keep thinking it just, you know, stays within those two areas, but even software is a major issue. But also, um, just as equal, one needs to think about ability of the learner and um, how that ability 
um, impacts his or her ability, ability to move forward in, in their classes and with their academic goals. Um, sheer navigation, like I truly do mean this, sheer navigation of a, an environment that's foreign um, to them and in some systems, in some instances, it really doesn't even work for them, you know, in regard to their learning style um, should be factored in at all, at all times. You know, not that um, we have uh, a way to stop what's happening, but we can uh, impact what's happening towards a positive direction. And I can't emphasize enough that uh, this online learning, I know and truly feel when the data comes out will have a disproportionate effect upon some populations of students. Another area that we need to broadly think about is the um, mental capacity and the coping skills for students and in some cases, you know, disenfranchised populations or underrepresented populations. You know, like we can all think as professionals, we have coping skills in our briefcases, but students may not have all these coping skills um, to help them, you know, in regard to their skill sets. Um, that uncertainty is, is definitely something that makes them anxious. Um, and also taking knocks and bumps and digs. You know, when I say digs, I think about the, uh, you know, international population of students that, you know, take digs from other people and put downs and stuff like that. So, you know, thinking about the coping skills. Now, I'm going to go into what can be done. And for some of you, this may be redundant. I, I know you know it, but I think we need to emphasize it in all areas. And I do have resource information that I could pass along to, you know, Dr. Tyler, and it could be posted even in the ODP, I mean, in the website, you know, it, we could share this among professionals. Um, so you'll hear this all the time, and you've heard it from other administrators, you know, we do not want to compromise on learning. And I don't think it should be compromised. I don't think it should be dumbed down or watered down just because we went to an online platform. Rather, the option should be to supplement that platform with mechanisms of achieving the learning objectives and the outcomes for the class. So I'll emphasize that a little bit more. It should be supplemented in regard to different areas that the students can succeed. Um, I have to emphasize to everyone that researchers who have students and teachers and other professionals should reach out to the students. Um, you know, reach out to them often. Sometimes it falls on a, you know, like a deaf email, as in you've emailed two or three times and you get no response, but reach out anyway, you know. Um, and when you are in those online or remote learning platforms, you know, make it a point to, you know, call upon the students um, and specifically learn their names. Like I even say to the students, you should learn your professor's name. And, you know, as a part of my retention efforts for them to, you know, personalize the situation so they can call them out, um, get to know them, invite them into conversations that are relative to their learning, um, but also, you know, the academic information, and it personalizes the information. Um, so, you know, to do that. Um, also, everyone should be aware is that the, the student that is the most vulnerable is the one that may not hold up his or her hand for assistance. They are just sitting back and watching the, the landscape or their anxiety or fear is sitting there or they don't want to look stupid. I've heard some students say that or they are embarrassed. But if everybody could keep that in the back of their mind that the student that may be the most vulnerable may be not that person, that student that raises their hand for assistance. Um, emphasizing offering multiple mechanisms for achievement of learning objectives examples, examples, more examples, you know, like that. Um, and remembering that communication really, really is beneficial for students. 
thus like clear and concise messages. You know what? It's beneficial for us. You know, like the information about everything that's going on. We want to hear it from the president. We want to know this as professionals. So you can imagine, again, going back to the students who do not have those coping skills and are at a loss for what to do. So communication and multiple mechanisms. Um, also monitoring, um, making sure that you monitor uh, computer times. You know, like it really can throw off one's cycle in regard to their sleep cycle or what happens to them mentally from the electronic mediums. Like everybody wants to throw in all of their stuff. So, but you know, you have to recognize that if, if every students are and everyone is getting it from multiple mechanisms, there could be other things that are happening. Um, sometimes you can't impact that, but if you're aware of it, you're less likely to throw in five more hours of videos that some might need to watch or something like that. Um, but also throwing in five more hours, making sure you accommodate the time to do that, you know, like a longer period of time. Um, and remember that students learn in a variety of learning styles, like, you know, the auditory learning style, you see it the visual learning style, you know, you're, you're hearing it, read the auditory hearing it, and you're seeing it. And then the kinesthetic style of hands-on. When they're in classes, they can get two of these styles and even three of these styles down pat because they see the professor, they're giving examples, they're doing all kinds of things. You know, in some cases, the online learning environment has taken away some of that factor. So just kind of remember that we all have different learning styles and try to accommodate those styles if possible. Sometimes it's just not possible. Um, and, you know, like just to encourage the direct reach out to the students, you know, and not just, I notice you haven't been in class. Hey, so-and-so, you know, like I'm checking in with you, anything I can do or, you know, something like that. Um, I want to end my comments because I, I, I'm sure I'm at my time limit in my comments that's to saying that the current situation hopefully has encouraged everyone to be a bit more empathetic as well as sympathetic and accommodating as applied to addressing the student needs in this time of crisis. But, you know, also, you know, like recognizing what we can do or what you can do as professional, professionals that impact student success for the long run in regard to teaching activities and reaching, uh, I mean, and research activities um, and things of that nature. Uh, thank you. Ursia, thank you very much for what you shared. Um, I also just want to make the connections that uh, what you've shared can apply to many of the audiences that we all try to reach in our programming or the classes that we're teaching. So I appreciate your reflections. We're gonna open up a poll at this moment uh, to have you as participants, um, if you would participate by um, answering the questions, which resource is not available online through MS uh, U Extension Remote Learning and Resources? So one of these um, resources is not available online. So if you'd like to take a moment just to vote, and we'll open up the polls for you to be able to um, provide the what you think is the correct answer of the resource not available through the extension remote learning and resources. The poll is now open. If you take a moment to vote. Okay, I'll just give you another minute or so to, uh, to vote. And then in a minute, we will flash the um, final poll answers uh, on the screen. Okay, 
gave a poll as Andy. And she draw, I don't see the poll, so I think I'm gonna have to have you provide the, oh, here we go. So 81% um, is the pet resources for MSUE or MSU employees. That is the correct answer. Um, know that on the MSU Extension Remote Learning and Resources, we have information on adult learning resources, educational resources for school closures, family and community resources, and health and uh, wellness resources. So thank you for participating in that poll. We'll have one in between each of the presenters. And I also want to remind you as participants that you can um, share any questions for the presenters in the chat. And then at the end, we have time allotted for question and answers. I now want to turn things over to Naeem Edwards, the director of the MSU Detroit Partnership for Food, Learning, and Innovation. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Naeem, as DeAnardo mentioned. I am an extension employee in Detroit. Just my screen a bit. Um, I do have some slides to share, so I'll try to share my screen. Um, okay. Share screen. It says that it's disabled. Um, so host disabled Chris's been screen sharing. Okay, so I can't share my screen. Uh, essentially, the questions we were asked to address were, how has the stay home guidelines affected us? I really appreciated uh, the last speaker, Dr. Garcia, for sharing all the ways that inclusion is important as an extension staff person. Um, historically, I had done almost exclusively like in-person, very close direct uh, contact, like hands-on stuff with folks. So now um, I am kind of shifting to a predominantly online kind of outreach. Um, prior to, I guess, the onset of COVID-19 issues, um, I was developing an urban agriculture and urban forestry research site in Detroit. Um, and that center was supposed to function for both research and extension programming purposes. Um, so the site is still under development, but now that we are, I guess, kind of deprioritizing getting large numbers of people to come to the site, um, I'm kind of reorienting to a way of utilizing that site as a platform for video series, um, as well as figuring out ways that I, as a extension agent can be of service to people of Detroit, in particular the urban agriculture community. Um, so one of the ways that I've had to reorient was research was kind of a, a top priority, as I mentioned before. And now um, I'm trying to be more mindful of um, issues that are more pertinent and relevant to serving um, both the urban agriculture and local residents in Detroit. So it is very likely um, that as we progress through April and into May, I will be scaling up food production at the site and figuring out and coordinating ways um, to both provision that food and involve people um, in, I guess, the safest ways possible and doing both production there um, and at their homes or in their local neighborhoods. Um, I will probably do a ton, well, maybe not a ton, but maybe a weekly or monthly video series on different ways to do urban agriculture, do food preservation kinds of things, um, teach folks ways that they can be more self-reliant. Um, so ways that if, if we are to continue to stay in our homes and kind of minimize going out into the world, ways that we can really optimize utilizing resources that we have um, in our local neighborhoods, if not in our homes and in our yards, um, if we have access to those things. Um, and pretty much at the moment, YouTube, Facebook, and Zoom are the primary uh, tools that I have been using. Um, 
And then also, you know, everyone, almost everyone to my knowledge has a cell phone and internet. So just as it pertains to keeping in touch with folks and keeping people abreast of the hundreds of opportunities that are emerging, not only within Extension, but across organizations um, nationally, uh, whenever I see a link to a video or an online course or something, there are multiple listservs and Facebook groups that I am reaching out to and sharing that information with. Um, the Detroit, Detroit Urban Farmers have their own Facebook page, so if there's a particular niche or issue, um, if you have Facebook and you don't know about, you could consider establishing a Facebook page um, as kind of a resource sharing, think tank, kind of smaller network, inclusive network uh, for sharing information with folks around a particular issue. Um, and then another thing that I that I just started doing um, since I've been working from home is I have been trying to increase my relationship just with my neighbors. Um, so last week I wrote on just like small little thank you cards like the size of this. Uh, just a note to my neighbors saying that my name is Naim Edwards. I work for Michigan State University. Um, I currently specialize in urban agriculture, but as an extension agent, I'm happy to uh, try to help you whatever ways possible that I can within my work, as well as just as a neighbor to you. And I just dropped those off in people's um, doorsteps or doorways uh, and just went a couple houses down in every direction from my house. Uh, and I think that's a really important way as we kind of scale up our use of screens and our use of um, essentially keeping ourselves at home and using technology. Also just recognizing that there are people all around us as faculty, as extension agents, as MSU staff, who don't even necessarily know um, the relevance, the, the resourcefulness that can be utilized just from knowing people who work for extension and for Michigan State University. Um, and in the time that I passed those out, I just also included my email and the notes that I left neighbors and certain neighbors have reached back and said, thanks. Um, and I've slowly started to kind of field questions and inquiries that people have. So I think uh, although you, we can't necessarily interact with these people face to face, we can tighten up and strengthen our networks locally um, simply by kind of doing smaller things of saying for the people who you do see and live near, there's a ton of opportunities for engaging uh, those populations as well that may not even have known we exist. And they're also the closest people to us physically. Um, I think that's about all that I have. More food production. Yeah, so I will wrap with that um, and open it up. Naeem. Yes. Sorry, I see a question in the chat for you. Um, do all the people under your command area have success um, to the internet or smartphone? And how are your extension professionals like you going to hand over the input if the programs demand so? over the input. Uh, so all the, depending on how you interpret under me, I currently don't supervise anyone. I will have um, interns uh, starting in May. Um, and they do have access to internets and smartphones as it pertains to staff who I'm actually responsible for supervising. Um, as it pertains to the people that I serve, I know for a fact that not everyone, both who live near the site, as well as probably people in my neighborhood, probably don't have um, internet or a smartphone. Not everyone has it in their homes. Um, and how am I and extension professionals like me going to hand over the input if the program's demands? I'm not sure what that, what the, what handing over the input means if the person could clarify the question. Oh, okay, um, how are extension professionals gonna hand over? So yeah, we'll kind of troubleshoot our way through physical resources. Um, one idea that I've had and been asked to do is for things like using a tractor or power tools 
Um, if it's a service that I can provide directly, simply creating space, scheduling a time to go do that and go out into the neighborhood and use those things uh, without interacting with others. Um, there are, and I, I benefit a lot from having a ton of partnerships in Detroit uh, with other organizations involved in urban agriculture in particular. And they are pretty much um, all scheduling things pertaining to like curbside pickup, curbside drop off of transplants or seeds. Um, and these are kind of opportunities to get resources straight into the hands of people without having to um, invite people into a space or having people standing in line um, or having to go up to someone's doorstep and actually, um, you know, violate the six foot um, buffer between folks. So I'll probably end up coordinating as we get further into the growing season ways to make uh, both plant and seed resources more available, as well as uh, figuring out ways and kind of a protocol or best practices for offering services without having to be in close contact with folks. Uh, I have, so the, the DP Fly, uh, the site that I manage, we just completed construction. I see a, a question, I'll just read it out. Um, have you considered increasing the Wi-Fi at DP Fly so neighbors could connect the internet uh, from your site? Um, we just completed our first building uh, mid-February, so about six weeks ago. Um, that building currently does not have internet because after construction was completed, I was in the process of getting Comcast to come out and install a line to hook up internet. And as um, the stay home, stay safe order and all these things came about, Comcast was no longer doing those kinds of installations. Um, that building is also at least 300 feet from the nearest home. So people who live near the site would probably, best case scenario, just drive up to the building or sit around the building to use internet. Uh, but that is something that hopefully in May we can resolve and make internet at the site public and more accessible. Well, thank you, Naeem. Um, as other questions come in towards the end, we'll make sure that they're uh, presented to you if you want to speak to them. Appreciate um, your uh, reminding us that one of the things that we can do is to reach out to our local network of our neighbors and making sure that they know that we could be a resource now or in the future and appreciate those um, uh, what you're doing to make that happen in your neighborhood. Thank you, Leonardo. Yeah, um, I'm going to um, ask you to vote on the next poll and that poll is uh, true or false, MSU's first urban food research center will enhance efforts to open opportunities for urban agricultural entrepreneurship and offer new partnerships for community and youth development. So if you want to take a minute to um, vote true or false on this question, and then in uh, two or three minutes, we'll close that and we'll share the, the poll results with you. We're now ending the poll, and in just a moment, we'll share the final results. Those of you that have participated, it is true. I think Naeem has this vision and also uh, is looking for continuous support and um, uh, networks that we can all help with in helping to further this mission and providing the opportunities in this urban center of Detroit um, so that uh, we can all do the work in connecting with uh, the populations uh, that we may already be serving or the, or the ones that we have in our future plans to serve in the Detroit metro area. I now want to um, introduce Emily Proctor, who is the Tribal Extension Educator um, in Emmett County for MSU Extension, and she's going to share some of her wisdom around work that is uh, happening in their tribal communities in ways that that can be enhanced. Ah, miigwech. Uh, Ani, Odemikwe, Indijnikas, Megizi and Dodum, uh, Lansing Cross Village, Indonjaba, Harbor Springs, Enda. And that is our traditional introduction in Anishinaabe Moen. Uh, strawberry woman, I am 
uh, is my name and I am of the Eagle Clan. I come from Lansing and Cross Village and I live in Harbor Springs. Uh, so miigwech to each of you for taking time to be with us today and miigwech for the invitation to share with you. So as I was preparing for this morning or this afternoon, there's been uh, several, <laughs> several ways that the stay at home, stay safe mandate, um, distancing, us being very careful on um, meeting face-to-face, -face, stopping our programming face-to-face -face has impacted my work and working from home. So what I had wanted to share with you was a map of the state of Michigan. And what you'll see in the state of Michigan is a, I'm getting into it right now. We have approximately 12 federally recognized tribes across Michigan. And my work at MSU Extension is to provide um, coordination, build networks, build relationships, and to create programming under the areas of leadership and good governance in partnership with our federally recognized tribes, with our indigenous people across the state of Michigan and um, across the lifespan, if you will. So the work that I do very, very much hinges upon the face-to-face -face work that um, we've been doing for the past 11 years since I've been on board with Extension. So with having to transition to working from home, and having the strong partnerships and relationships that we've built, it's been, um, it's been difficult, but yet it's been a very beautiful process to see that when we do emails, when we engage through Zoom, that those relationships are continuing to stand, right? That we're continuing to have conversations on what it looks like to transition some of our programming to an online platform, how I can continue to be a resource for our tribal nations during this time of, um, of sadness, of uncertainty, yet much hope, if you will. So having to work from home has been difficult, but I'm also finding that our tribal partners and our tribal colleges, which we have three of across the state, one in Keweenaw Bay, one in Bay Mills, and one in uh, Saginaw Chippewa, that work continues, relationship continues. And I think Naeem, you really hit, um, hit home with me in the sense that reaching out to people to the best of your ability, um, making those phone calls. I cannot stress how much I shared with, um, with my counterparts too, my coworkers, pick up the phone, pick up your cell phone, um, see how people are doing. Just call and do a check-in, call and see what you might be able to offer. Here in Emmett County and at Little Travers, we've been able to offer MSUE's license for Zoom capability, we've offered that to our tribal council here at Little Traverse. And yesterday we met for the first time on Zoom as a council, as leadership from all three branches of our government. And that was made possible as a result of the technology and support and partnership with MSU Extension. So how can we utilize our technology, our resources, our innovation, to make good governance, to make partnerships, to make communities, boards, uh, commissions functional in this current time. One difficult piece, and I think this was mentioned from a previous um, presenter, is the connectivity. And we have a youth council here that, now that our youth are at home, trying to figure out what education will look like in the future for them, we've continued to stay in contact and how are we best able to assist them knowing that connectivity is an issue, right? It's a barrier. And um, knowing that those certain, certain times of the day, certain, um, certain times when they're coordinating with their family, if they're able to drive to a parking lot to access internet, even if our youth are able to access food, medical care, you know, there's so many things that I think it's important for us to keep in mind when we do reach out that we're not adding undue stress. You know, it's important to remind them we have programs and opportunities that will ease in some of their stress and their work, but also knowing that we have families in crisis. We have families who are trying to figure out what are they going to do in the interim when they've been laid off, aren't able to go to work, have youth at home from all ages who now have to figure out the education system. So I find that if there's a way for me to touch base, to be that support, to listen, 
and offer what I can based on what we can provide here in extension, that's, that's what I can do. Um, so from a government standpoint, knowing that we are all across the state from tribal governments, we have indigenous people from all across the country, across Michigan, every 83 counties across the state. So how can we continue to be that resource, that support, that listening ear during this time? And I think that's the beautiful part of extension is not only the depth and breadth of what we're able to offer, but the fact that we live in the communities. We have been in many communities across the state and we can continue to be that support, that sustainable partner who is able and willing to be flexible in these times. Um, and I also would like to share that uh, in extension, we've been trying to make our webinar, make our um, tribal governance programs, make some of our relationship building programs more accessible internally to extension as an opportunity for professional development, but also bringing in tribal partners to facilitate conversations. We are having up an upcoming webinar series where we're asking uh, the Director of Archives and Records from Little Traverse Bay Bands to present on cultural appropriation. We're asking uh, Catherine Fort from the MSU Indigenous Law and Policy Center to provide an update on ICWA, knowing that there are still many, many different issues and serious issues that are going on while we are all struggling with the current COVID-19 crisis as well. But how can we continue having those conversations occur? And that's where we can be flexible, we can be nimble and be responsive, but really pulling on the key people who are in our communities who are on the ground doing the work. And as extension, that is where I see I can fit in right now too, is helping to build those bridges, those connections, and ensuring that all of us at MSU, MSUE, have access to our partners in the tribes, but also tribes are able to learn more about who we are, what we can offer, we can continue to build that trust, right? And I'd like to leave you with also, um, we have folks across extension, Leonardo, Naim, we have Catherine Jacques, who is working with tribes regarding uh, tribal food systems. We have folks on the ground who are working diligently to continue responding to the needs of tribes. So if you have questions, you have any, um, would like to learn more about tribes, would like to learn how to build more connection, um, please reach out to us. But I also want you to know that many of our tribal nations are struggling, trying to figure out how to find funding to support their staff from a distance, to support food for elders programs, to respond to the increase and influx of people applying for food assistance, right? Our folks in tribal nations wear many hats, not only in the nation, but also in the community as elders, as grassroots leaders, right? So how can we be a support to them not adding one more iron to their fire or thing to their plate. So working in tribes is a very rewarding and beautiful piece, but it's also recognizing that tribes are um, sovereign, are figuring out how this works, are building their response to the crisis and what this will look like in the future. Hope that helps. Again, miigwech for your time. If there's any questions now and in the future, please know I'm here. I'm here to support. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, again, remind you that you can pose questions in the um, chat and then at the end of uh, the presentations from each of our speakers, we'll be able to come back and answer those. Um, I also do want to um, just um, share with you something that I think it's, it's uh, relevant now and it can be relevant throughout our work with tribal communities and that is to ask ourselves whether we work for the College of Ag or we work for Extension, what is our role in supporting the sovereignty of these 12 sovereign nations that exist within our state? And that may be something, again, that we can reflect on as we continue our work um, in these communities. And so now I'm going to ask if Shidra, if you can um, pose the poll question. And the question is, which guide is not available on the MSU Guide to Remote Access? So again, if you would take a moment to um, participate in the poll, provide your answer to one of these four um, guides. One of these four is not available on the MSU Guide to Remote Access. 
then you can begin um, providing your answer. And in a moment, we'll close the poll and provide a uh, snapshot of what you are indicating is not available in the MSU Guide to Remote Access. And if you could um, participate in the poll, it'll be closed in just a minute, and then we will see uh, your answers to this poll question. Okay, the poll is ending. And she drive lost the poll, so if you could put that back up with the final results. Okay, so the um, guide that it's not available is keep MSU exploring. And if you haven't noticed in the chat room, uh, Shidra is also providing us with the link to the different resources that are being, you're being asked to respond to. Um, so I'll now move us to uh, hearing from Dr. Rebecca uh, Grummet from the Plant and Soil Science. Hello everyone. First of all, I, I really want to thank all the, the prior speakers for their insights and suggestions and, and giving a broader perspective to me as somebody who's been a part of the community for a long time on, on the breadth and depth of what MSU can and is doing. When we were given the title, I think it's really apt, practicing inclusion in times of ambiguity and turbulence. But before I go further, I'd like to First of all, note that I have the great fortune that neither I nor my loved ones, my family or friends are, are currently sick with COVID. And I know that as we look to the broader community, that isn't or ne won't necessarily be the case for everyone. Also, I'd like to note that I'm lucky that my income is not directly threatened. And we heard about other cases where financial insecurity is a problem. And I know it is for, for many in the broader MSU community. So keeping that perspective in mind, I, I will say something about the impacts that this time has had on my work in teaching and research, and then more broadly about factors that may be impacting early career faculty. So for teaching, I, like everyone else, has had to rapidly switch to online venues, and I appreciate insights given by Dr. Dorcia Chison for some of the suggestions of how to supplement that. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate that I have a small class this semester, and that's made it possible for me to reach out to each student individually on more than one occasion, wish that they and their families are healthy, review status of assignments and projects, and make sure that things aren't falling through the cracks. I've also relaxed deadlines, recognizing that students may have had to move mid-semester, have general upheaval in their lives, and um, may have connectivity complications in, in some of the cases. Turning to research, this has had um, caused some real challenges for us. We've had to terminate some ongoing experiments. We've had to put other experiments on hold, including some with samples that may or may not last, depending on the length and the depth of the restrictions that we're going to face. And it's possible that one or more of my grad students may be set behind as much as a year um, in their research, depending on how things continue to go. So we've obviously been making alternative plans for what people can and should be working on now. 
we've been doing scenario planning, what do we do if we can't be back into the lab or the greenhouse or the field and for how long and under what conditions? We've resumed our weekly lab meetings via Zoom. We've re replaced informal daily interactions that we would normally have at the lab with a weekly additional coffee just to touch bases and make sure everybody's doing okay. And I know that many other research groups are implementing a variety of creative ways to stay in touch and do their best to move forward during these times. One other aspect to point out that many faculty face is that we pay our graduate students with grant funds. And if their research is greatly set back, we have concerns about how we're going to find funds to support them for the additional time that is needed. So that's my perspective as a senior faculty. But I think if we look at early career and pre-tenure faculty, all of these concerns are magnified. In addition, um, other groups or other individuals may be facing problems within their families or extended families of, of possible illness or job insecurity. Many of the young faculty also have young children at home. So that means in addition to trying to carry on their responsibilities with respect to reaching research or teaching or extension, they're also carrying out many additional home responsibilities. At the other end of the spectrum, we may have um, recently hired um, faculty that have moved here alone and are relatively new in the community. And so they're experiencing even greater social isolation than those of us who have others, significant others or families close by. Fortunately for faculty, the university has responded in some very substantial ways, including an automatic one-year extension of the tenure clock. Nobody is obligated to take that, but anyone can take advantage of that. That's automatic, it doesn't have to be requested. As well as a recognition of the upheaval caused by the quick transfer to online and the impact that might have on our ability to successfully deliver courses this semester. And so SERS ratings for faculty will not be um, considered as part of their evaluations for this semester. I think probably most important for me and for others is to recognize that people may be facing a wide range of challenges that those challenges may change over time, and that certainly challenges for others may be different from the challenges that we're facing. And we need to give people the consideration and space to deal with those challenges. But looking at this, I also think this gives us a chance to heighten our awareness, not only now and not only with respect to COVID-19, but in general, moving forward as we think about we realize now the broader community and how people can be affected in different ways. So how can we better practice inclusion as we move forward? And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, important for us to know that our university serves many different um, constituents and the people that uh, we are trying to move along in different processes are also being affected by this. And so Dr. Grumman, I really appreciate, um, you know, what you've shared about the different populations that are part of our community and the ways in which um, our current situation may be impacting them, some disproportionately and others um, who uh, are maintaining statuses and continuing to do the best that they can uh, given the, the uh, new normal that we're experiencing at this point. I want to move us to our next poll question. And that question has to do with um, our waiver requests was clearly and explicitly state the relationship between the proposed activity with the guidelines for essential research in order to be considered for an exemption. So if you can uh, answer, uh, contribute your answer as true or false to this poll, it's open now and in a few minutes we'll close it and share the final results with the poll group. The poll is now closed and Shidra, if you can share. So this is, um, for those of you that participated, yes, this is true, that your waiver request must clearly and explicitly state 
the relationship between the proposed activity with the guidelines for essential research in order to be considered a burden exemption. And again, um, Shidra will be sharing the link to uh, that information in the chat and uh, appreciate those of you that participated. Our last presenter for our, our time together is Lauren Cooper from Forest Carbon and Climate Program. And she will talk about leveraging technology to engage multiple audiences with inclusive principles. So I hand things over to you now, Lauren. And I unfortunately, I just jumped on. I was on another call. Um, so, but from what I'm, you know, I, I realize everyone's in really different places um, with what their their challenges are and um, their the the needs they're trying to meet for for faculty and for students. Um, and so, I'm kind of now realizing that maybe. Maybe I could just give a high level of what our program does. We operate largely in the digital space. We um, uh, have, and I'll show this, all of, our, all of our courses and professional training is online. We were moving towards having like a workshop this summer that's gotten postponed. But I want to just share what we're doing in case it um, inspires any different ideas or other types of solutions in your own work. And I'd be happy to be a point person to answer any questions about some of the things that, that we do um, and how we figured it out. Um, so I wanted to introduce this beginning that we work in forestry, um, but this part here that we inherently, we're looking at forestry as a natural climate solution. So we're thinking about forestry really big and broad beyond just products. We're looking at landscape level management, policymakers. So we just inherently have a really wide range of stakeholders, professional groups, and career paths. So we have to think really broadly and inclusively right away when we are thinking about engaging with, with different audiences. Uh, you know, we don't really have the luxury to only operate in graduate school. Not that it's a luxury, but we have, it's just challenging sometimes. We have to, we, whenever we're thinking of putting something out, we have to think inclusively, like, what are the assumptions we can make of somebody coming into this? Uh, what type of training? We have people that are foresters, people that are um, policymakers. So there's kind of, there's a lot of values of inclusiveness that come into our work. Um, and it starts out at the very core of how do we even communicate these topics that are pretty complex to a wide, a wide range of individuals. Um, these are the four major work areas that we have. So we're in formal education and non-formal education. We do research and projects and a lot of stakeholder engagement. And this is all largely in a digital space. This is our graduate certificate. It's been online since 2013, I believe. Um, and we have three courses. We have an international audience for this. Um, and I'm gonna talk at the end, my last couple slides are um, some kind of our current best practices. Um, so I'll save that, but we do have an international audience and there are some challenges that we've overcome um, that might be relevant for uh, more of my colleagues now with the current situation. And sometimes it can be funny little solutions. Like for example, um, when we have people living in places that don't have very good internet access or it comes and goes, they're not able to live stream, uh, or to, not live stream, they're not able to stream our uh, presentations very well. So when we have those that we upload the full PowerPoint with embedded audio so that they can download slowly. In some cases, it'll take them hours to download it, but they're able to access the material. So um, sometimes it's been finding little, having little challenges like that. And of course, across time zones, that's some other types of challenges, but uh, in, as far as uh, making that content available to them, um, that's been a, one example of a small solution for the graduate certificate. Um, the other thing that we're really active in is professional short courses. These are all again online. Um, and some things to point out here is that even in creating this short course is um, an exercise in inclusivity. So we found that the, the graduate certificate was three full graduate courses and it just was a lot for a lot for working professionals. It's a great fit for certain people that um, are finding themselves wanting to do a deep dive in that in that topic area that there was a much larger suite of professionals that are finding themselves needing to know a little bit about forest carbon, everything from urban foresters to uh, uh, wood procurement, decision makers for big companies, and even big, big other sectors like energy and aviation that are looking at offset markets. Um, and there's no, there was no training available and the grad cert was too long. So we wanted to create something that was that was really more inclusive to a wider range of backgrounds and was a lower time commitment. So we launched this course um, that's about six to eight weeks. 
Um, but we really wanted to make it kind of like attractive and easy to jump into um, because we, here's my next slide, we did build it into D2L, but you can see how we kind of broke up the, the landing page so that it's attractive and easy to understand um, because they're not, they're not students at MSU, so they're, they're not accustomed to being in D2L where they have courses that they're used to seeing in there. So um, we took some, some extra steps to make sure that the online interface was um, easy to understand and felt really intuitive for people um, that have uh, maybe not done any online learning and this is the only time they're, they're joining um, the, the MSU online learning space. Um, here we have, um, this is another, oops, this is another example here of, of a short course. Um, and I like to point this, this is another one that we just launched this year. It's called Forest Certification and Climate Change. Um, and this one's even shorter and it's really um, geared towards the, the financial support we had to create the course is from one of the major forest certification bodies. Um, and this has been kind of a unique challenge because in the last course we're getting here, we're getting a lot of professionals um, that are um, like in NGOs and um, business sector. Um, when we're looking at this next course, what we're seeing here is it's um, like logger, logging community. And so there was, we've noticed immediately when we put up the course, there's, there were some additional challenges with getting into the online learning space and feeling comfortable in that space. Um, and so we're really aware of that. We're always trying to collect feedback from people and um, get to know our audience a little bit um, and what they're comfortable with and what they're less comfortable with. So we started um, getting some ideas to create some additional support for this course as people um, really had seemed maybe less likely to have engaged in, in online learning in the past. Um, and another example of kind of an inclusive um, exercise and work that we do is we have a lot of, um, we've been purposely putting out a freely available learning material. So here's a learning module on the Climate Change Resource Center. It's about 25 minutes, it's freely available. Um, so a teacher could use this in a classroom um, and um, you know, anyone, any landowner could have access to this information very easily. Um, in another example, we have a monthly webinar series. So this is, again, kind of work that we've been, been able to kind of continue very seamlessly throughout all of this. Um, and we just had our, our webinar this last week, but we do record them and make them available. So um, for those in different time zones and for those with different um, work challenges or time constraints, they are all recorded and available on our website so they can be used as learning tools or reference points at any time um, in the future. Um, and another example of some open source materials that we have, um, part of our content development for our online learning was to create a series of field videos, which are up here, but also um, using a light board that we built in the forestry department. Um, we um, created some videos breaking down some of the more, the, the, the mathematical steps, um, doing plot math and carbon analysis. Um, and we found that there's been surprising value added um, of this material. Uh, for example, this is um, Dr. Dave McFarlane, um, and he's found that it's been great to have these resources available for his students um, because people, you know, learn at different um, at different speeds. And for some people, getting through uh, you know, having a lecture just once is not, um, you know, if you get confused at the beginning, you're kind of confused the whole time. And um, having some of these kind of one, some of his more technical aspects recorded and um, being uh, made available to anyone in for his course, but in any of the other courses at in the forestry department can also tap into these and give um, use them as reminder video. So sometimes this is like a sophomore level course that they first learn about this. It's like, do they remember it their senior year? Um, so having these available, they are incorporated into our professional development courses, but having them available um, has, it has just kind of continued to um, provide dividends, uh, which has been really exciting. Um, and I think actually very supportive to the wide range of, of, of learners that we have um, engaging with the forestry department now. Um, and here's another example. We've gone, we work in a very kind of unique space. And so we've had to create a lot of our own graphics and imagery. Um, and a lot of this is taking 
seemingly complex ideas and making them as simple as possible. Um, and these are also, um, we have them available for download. So I'm starting to see them incorporated into um, colleagues' uh, presentations when I'm at meetings and in other places, which has been really exciting. Um, but we've also gotten really great feedback from students and professionals in our courses um, saying like, well, I, I never really understood that cap and trade idea until that I saw the way that you, you guys visualized it. Um, so that's been very um, rewarding as well. Um, I want to turn on my video too while I'm talking, sorry. Um, and we've also created a series of tools to help um, folks um, engage with other online learning, other tools. So sorry, these are online-based tools from the US Forest Service. Um, and we've created activities to better understand what those tools do um, with some scenarios and kind of step-by-step -step instructions so they can check their answer um, when they walk through them. So we're trying to leverage existing resources that, that people have easy access to. Um, and create additional um, ways to learn from them and feel more confident and comfortable with them. Um, and then just to kind of wrap up here, um, we do have, you know, we've taken some concerted efforts to have inclusive principles and activities um, in the forest carbon and climate program. Excuse me, one second. A little children thing happening in the background. Um, uh, but we have, you know, the Forest Carbon and Climate Program, we, we've worked together. We, we really explicitly value a, a wide range of learning abilities and levels. Um, and we value a range of expertise and training background. Um, and this has become, you know, really clear. We are working with folks um, that have PhDs and we're working with field technicians and we're working with people from different parts of the world that have totally different baselines for the training that they're receiving in the first place. Um, and a range of abilities. So this is including in the English language um, or experience with professional writing. Um, we want people to be able to come into our program and feel um, that they're able to, um, you know, function in a way that is, uh, that the way that they communicate and the way that they operate is already valuable, um, but that we're able to support them in continuing to develop professionally from wherever they're at. Um, and so some of our best practices um, so far, uh, you know, with online learning and that we do so much online, we recognize that there are um, challenges and then there's also really um, a lot of opportunity. So um, we, and they're, they're, they kind of go hand in hand and it's, um, it's a, for us, it's an effort that is how to, how to overcome the challenges and how to leverage the opportunities. Um, so overcoming challenges of remote engagement, you know, we have, we've really strived to provide very, very, very clear instructions. Go out of our way to make um, PDFs with, with screenshots. Um, we just um, released a new onboarding video um, that um, is demonstrating to professionals once they've signed up for a course, exactly the communications that they will receive um, and you know, what to expect as far as getting into the online learning space. So we don't want people to start engaging with our program and then feel lost right away. It's not a good feeling. Uh, so we want them to feel supported. Um, and, uh, and this is a big point here is we don't, we try not to make assumptions about uh, comfort level. And, you know, this is of course a trial and error. So we've learned that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we would have made assumptions and then we'll get questions about something and we're like, okay, we cannot assume that that is something that people know. So we go, we really have gone, um, we've decided to err on the side of going um, out of our way to make sure things are extra clear and there's extra instructions or people get an extra follow-up email if they signed up for something with um, images of how it should look to join that online learning space. And I, I think that that's really gone, come along, or gone really far with um, getting people comfortable and feeling like they belong, um, you know, feeling um, confused or uncertain when you're again entering a new experience is um, uh, not not a good feeling and can make you feel like you don't belong there or something and that's certainly not what we want people to feel like when they're engaging with our materials. Um, some other um, challenges could be um, you know again the D2L space being confusing um, and um, but then we have a lot of um, opportunities. So where and this record activities actually should be below here, but we have we record our, a lot of our activities. So like uh, this session can be accessed later on, um, and this provides an opportunity to rewatch content multiple times. Again, referencing Dr. McFarland's um, 
mathematical steps break down, which depending on people's natural proclivities and their training, that might be like easy breezy, or that might be like, I need to watch this a few more times to get confident with it. Um, and having the recordings and making them available just provides students and learners the option to navigate that for themselves. Um, and we also point out that um, since we do get a lot of international interest, that um, our, our, uh, our content is really great for English as a second language folks. So for a lot of people that you know, they might not be very comfortable in, an, on, in, a, in a classroom environment yet, because they're, again, if, it's, it's, you know, if you get lost early on or you're struggling to understand it, you know, it doesn't matter if it's statistics or through the, a language barrier, it can feel really daunting and overwhelming. And, um, so for somebody that's just kind of getting warmed up in um, actually learning in English, we do find that it can be a great, a great way to um, give folks time to listen to things again, stop, slow down, uh, look up a word if they need to. Um, and we've gotten some nice feedback on that. Um, and another opportunity to highlight is that some folks are just more comfortable um, in online learning. So there are people that are um, not going to be comfortable contributing, speaking in core in a, in a course out loud, um, but they are happy taking time to write, you know, thoughtful written comments in a forum. Um, and so I do think that there can be, you know, value in in highlighting um, and making those spaces available. So, for example, in our in our course, our graduate courses, we do have as kind of best practices there as well to have both some optional or not, maybe depends on the instructor, but in my course, we have optional, a, a couple of Zoom meetings to, to come together and have discussions. And then we do a lot of um, written discussion boards. So people can, um, and they both would contribute to our participation grade. So people can you know, have a little bit more flexibility to find a place that uh, is more comfortable for them and that it's um, still, and also um, participating and communicating. Um, and then again, we have some best practices is making these open source learning materials. Um, but another big one is, you know, if we're moving into a digital world, um, it, uh, it's been really important for us to be very, very, very responsive to email, very friendly, um, really quick to um, troubleshoot, um, hop on quick Zoom meetings. Um, so, you know, Zoom meetings don't always have to be an hour long scheduled thing. You can just have a quick chat with somebody. Um, with students. Um, so feeling, making it feel like it's a little more like real life um, has been really important to us. And so we've had a, we've really um, developed this very friendly way of communicating with uh, professionals and students in the Forest Carbon and Climate Program. Um, so really make sure that there's a human feel to digital communications and a re to remember that there, and this is probably less likely to be an issue if you're you know, have students in your classroom but sometimes you're getting uh, questions about a course or questions about something and we're not sure how serious that person is and actually being getting involved in a program um, but we have to remember this is a human on the other side that is corresponding with us and so we have to make always make a really concerted effort to be extra friendly and make sure that we're um, you know, providing that extra friendly or for troubleshooting, make sure that we're being extra friendly and warm so that people feel that they're engaging with the human um, as well. Um, and we also use in our own team, um, we use chat a lot. Um, and I don't know if that's a tool that might be useful for, for you all if you're using that a lot, but we find that chat to be, um, we use, I use Zoom mostly with my immediate team, but Microsoft Teams also has chat. But it's really easy to take quick screenshots um, and and bring things back and and kind of flip things back and forth. And in our own team, we have a range of age groups and um, and I find that chat can be just a very like friendly and consistent and very efficient kind of communication that a lot of people um, seem to you know get seem to like to use and it can move things along um, quickly when especially when you're we're all getting lots of emails all the time. Um, another big thing um, as far as some of our inclusive learning practices is providing extra feedback beyond the core course content. Um, this is something that's come up for me a lot with um, international students in the graduate level courses. Um, so sometimes just taking the time to provide some extra feedback on um, citations and uh, using resources correctly and um, maybe making corrections about like English language norms 
Um, so I, you know, really go out of my way to make sure that, and that certainly can be information that's valuable to people um, from the United States as well. Not, you know, with these, these are all things that we've learned at different points. So um, at least in my um, learning environment, I try to be, um, you know, make sure that people have access or know where to find resources, you know, online. And um, there's a lot of great resources from the university or guidance um, and making sure that people know where to find that. Um, and again, we actually put a lot of that in like PDFs um, with screenshots and make them available at the beginning of our learning experiences to both kind of set the standard of these are expectations, um, but also make it really easy because you don't want to assume that people know how to do some of this stuff. Um, and then another, um, this is something that's been a part of our forestry department in general, but it's really relevant for, the, for our work area. Um, but I do think it's a tenant of being inclusive, um, which is exploring a really wide range of career opportunities. Uh, and, and I think that this really directly supports diverse students um, and professional audiences. Uh, you know, we're going to get a much wider range of students uh, if we are able to um, you know, communicate. But there's a lot of great jobs out there. It's not about you know, being in the middle of a national forest. There's a ton of policy jobs and um, planning jobs and all sorts of, of work. Um, and so that's been a big part of the, our, our program because our program's quite unique, um, is figuring out where, where are the paths forward and making sure that they're inclusive and wide ranging so that we're um, supporting, uh, again, a wider range of professionals. Um, and I was going to share this one little, just really quickly, like 10 seconds of this video, just to demonstrate this is the type of video that we're, we're just about to put this up on our website, but we want to make people feel really supported when they come in that they, um, they're not like, okay, so I've signed up, like now what's going to happen? That they feel like, oh, this is structured and I'm getting all the information. This video one. is intended to provide you with an overview of what you can expect after submitting a payment for a course through our online storefront. First, you'll receive an automated course purchase receipt from the email address noreply at msu.edu with the So that's probably all you need to see, but we just, just to demonstrate that we're, you know, trying to make, we get a wide range of ages, wide range of professional backgrounds, um, people that are from urban environments, rural environments. So we have gone the extra mile to make sure that um, people, again, feel supported and have access to um, enough information that they can jump into our um, engagement materials quickly. Thank you. Hey, I, I just wanted to jump in real quick and um, just, this is Philip Seaborn here. And just to let you know, Lauren, that there is a question on the floor. Oh. And before you kind of, before we kind of transition, I just wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to answer that. But um, the question is, are these continuing education unit courses, are they unit courses, are these free or fee-based courses? Did you have to seek help from MSU, the MSU hub to develop this? Or are there other resources within MSU to help with developing online courses like what you've shared? Thank you. Um, so yes, these are great questions. So this is stuff that we have worked hard to figure out, honestly, uh, for the last couple years. Um, so we, the, these are continuing education courses. Um, so the graduate course that I showed, you know, those are graduate courses. Um, the other ones are, are professional continuing education courses. They qualify for continuing education credits from different, you know, um, certifying bodies. So we, you know, we're affiliated with Society of American Foresters or um, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. So depending on your, your discipline, um, you would, you know, I, I don't know how that would work, but we work externally to get them, to get them approved for continuing education credits. Um, and they are fee-based. So we did, we have to create the first one, we got a USDA grant to um, design it and to issue it um, and implement it. So we did get financial support to cover, and actually the same with the other, the, um, the forest certification and climate change, we got a grant from us from the S Sustainable Forestry Initiative or SFI for that. So that's kind of been our model is to get some funding to help develop it, cover some of the overhead, overhead upfront. Um, and then that would also sponsor a number of people to go through the course. And then afterwards, we are able to offer it fee-based going forward. Um, we did consult with the hub, but I wouldn't say that we, um, that they, they didn't do any of the work for us. So we didn't, we didn't engage in any, 
we did get help from them. They pointed out to make the field videos. They helped connect us with the team that could do the field, the video production for that. So that was helpful. Um, and we have consulted with them a little bit, but we really ended up having to do a kind of a deep dive on our own. Um, and we, so we ended up having somebody that learned um, Captivate which is like a bit of a thing. So I would warn you, it's a bit of like a software actual thing. Um, but, um, but you know, we're starting to look at in the department of what kind of capacity do we want? Do we want someone on the team that can, that can do that type of stuff? And Captivate is basically like, um, it's like PowerPoint, but it's more like Adobe products, if you're familiar. So it has, it's more like has extra panels for like design stuff, but it like builds like a regular PowerPoint but then you like put the audio at the bottom so you can put in more animations. It's pretty nice. I didn't really learn how to do it that much myself, but there are other options. The, the other thing that we use in the graduate courses, which is simpler, is um, if you have a PC, you can download Adobe Presenter. And I don't know if this came up, so sorry if I'm repeating something from earlier, but I use Adobe Presenter myself and you download it and it becomes part of PowerPoint. It's just an extra tab. And then you can um, record your audio just like you would normally in PowerPoint, but from that tab. And it actually can export it as a um, like a window that has little arrows to go to the next slide. And it'll put your um, uh, script. If you put, plug your script in, it'll put your script in for you. So it's actually um, uh, accessible um, for a screen reader as well. So there, so that's, um, yeah. So those are some two, op two major options. Other than that, we've definitely, the video that I just showed you that's using Adobe Premiere, I personally do not know how to use that. So I have um, a team member um, who actually just left my team, but we have somebody new coming on who can do the premiere. So it's been, it's been challenging as far as the, the communication stuff, because I'll have a, I'll have a vision in my head of what I think needs to happen and what I know we need to make, but then the time, the time needed to do the technical components is not insignificant. Well, Lauren, thank you so much. It feels like this is just a great capstone to all the um, different presenters today that are giving us different perspectives of the ways that we can be uh, much more inclusive and thinking about the ways that we can uh, apply equitable practices to teaching and to learning. And I'm going to ask uh, Shidra if you want to go ahead and put up the poll for the last question. And then after that, I'm going to hand things over to Philip Seaborn, who can lead us through some questions and answers. Again, if you have any, you can post them and in just a moment we'll get to those. So Shidra, if you can put up the last poll. It's uh, asking about building a digital inclusive excellence atmosphere during stay-at-home guidelines as a community partnership between faculty, staff, and students. And so if you can participate in the poll, and in just a moment, we'll close it and get your um, results. Again, true or false, building a digitally inclusive excellence atmosphere during stay-at-home guidelines is a community partnership between faculty, staff, and students. Take a moment to give your answer true or false, and then we'll report out your um, responses. Thanks for those who are participating. It's going to be closing in just a minute. And the poll is now closed. Sheetra, if you want to share the results. And we've got um, all of you voting true. And uh, again, as you've learned from Lauren and other presenters, uh, anytime that we can do things with people and not to people, we are really working in, the, in an area where we can be more inclusive and more equitable in our approaches to sharing uh, the information that is important for all of us to learn from. And so I'm going to hand things over to Philip Seaborn, and he's going to um, ask questions of the, of, that you might have as participants for our panelists. So I do see some questions coming in on the chat. Um, and so yes, this, this uh, session will be recorded. And um, I, Shidra, I don't know if you have more information about where the recording will be found once, um, uh, once the session is recorded. Um, do you have any of that information? Um, once the session is uh, recorded and available, we will um, work with a &R Communications and post it to our DEI website. Thank you for that, Shidra. 
Um, also, if you do have any additional questions, um, please feel free to utilize the question and answer box and go ahead and post your questions and answers there and we'll see, I mean, I'm sorry, the questions there and we'll see if we can get you an answer. All right, so it looks like we don't have any questions right now. So great job, panelists. Um, so again, the set, this session is being recorded and we will definitely make sure that we send out an email with the link also once everything gets posted and it will be posted on the website at some point. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Tyler to uh, bring us to a close. Yes, uh, thank you, Philip. I also wanna thank all the panelists for taking uh, the time out of their schedule uh, to do this. And also thank you as viewers for being patient as we uh, transition in terms of technology. Again, uh, this is the first of, uh, of many webinars that we will have. Uh, Leonardo and I will have DEI with Leonardo and Quentin starting next week. More information will be sent out toward those uh, specific uh, opportunities for learning and development. And then also, I do wanna make it known that this is a collaboration uh, with the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and also the College of Ag and National Resources Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee. So again, thank you for those members, and also thank you to Leonardo for facilitating this discussion today. Again, as we conclude, there's a couple of things that I want to want to say or takeaway points that I've heard uh, from Dr. Chase, and she mentioned the, the need to have to be empathetic, sympathetic, and understanding. Uh, Naeem, I appreciated your perspective on providing the, the take the, the little notes and, and the acts of appreciation. Emily Proctor mentioned this is an opportunity to build trust within our communities. Dr. Grummet mentioned again about this uh, heightened awareness, not only currently, but in the future in terms of DEI. And then also Lauren uh, made note of try not to make assumptions about individuals' comfort level. So those are all key takeaway points to keep in mind going forward. But also as a community, a campus community, as MSU and partners, we do want you to know that we're thinking about you. And, and please be safe. 